Welcome back to the fifth episode of the Moving Average Podcast. I'm your host, Maddie, And I'm Max. Welcome. And those are our names. Somebody asked for those in the comments. And uh, maybe we'll do a different episode where we actually like, talk about our backgrounds, although most of you know a lot of my background just because where this is, this video. Um, but five new topics today, pretty good ones. WeWork has some drama with their CEO. Uh, Fifth Wall VC closed a big fund. Um, a little idea we're going to talk about that we've been talking about with seeding teams with established business models like Uber in a different country. Um, India is considering banning cryptocurrencies with some pretty hefty punishments. And finally, there's a scandal with DoorDash more or less stealing tips from drivers. Stay tuned for that one. That's at the end. Um, but let's go ahead and start with WeWork. And I, I think you yeah. know about more about this situation than I, so take it away. Yeah, so I'll go into it. So just we work, um, you know, they're broadly a uh, co-working like real estate company. Um, they own large office spaces and rent them out to uh, companies, and they've which is controversial enough in itself. Just that model in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, the tech world has like been confused about them for a long time because. Uh, you know, people complain that it's a real estate company getting valued at a software valuation. Yep. You know, software companies are often valued at 17 times revenue or more, uh, 10 to, you Specific know, 20 times there. revenue. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in my head. But, uh, you know, people are complaining it's a real estate company uh, getting valued at that, and, and it's not fair. And uh, WeWork's been buying up a lot of companies and somewhat strange mm -hmm. acquisitions. They buy and buying a lot of software companies. They're now the Wii company. Right. Yes, that's that's the parent company yeah. name, which you know they they own WeWork and they buy all these other companies managed by Q, a lot of other software mm -hmm. companies that some you know some don't see the synergy in. But anyways, they are uh, trying to IPO. It looks like this year, um, and you know there's been a lot of criticism around uh, the founder at Adam Newman. So he recently just cashed out 700 million in stock. So the company's not liquid yet. Most of the employees aren't liquid. Everybody's so that was like secondary tied market. Up. And he sold. So he got seven hundred million cash. Wow. For selling shares that he owns of his own company. And that doesn't include. Does that include just like borrowing against those shares? Because I know that's I, he fairly did, common he, practice. I don't think he he borrowed against them. Oh, okay. He, so he you know cashed out with that. So he's hundreds of millions liquid yeah there's been news he's set up a family office he's full-time people running it and yeah that's... for a ceo founder of a controversial company that's losing a lot of money every year that's about to ipo a lot of people don't like how that looks yeah i mean just thinking about it they're not ipo'd yet old buddy's cashing out now that's not necessarily good with prospects yeah. to the ipo <clears throat> well, it should be interesting the ipo just in general because with their model i mean like so they buy buildings and then they rent out smaller areas of those buildings, like individual offices or individual tables or whatever. Um, but like in a downturn, people will stop doing that and go to Starbucks and work. And like how is the – maybe the public market won't use that 20x revenue of a software company and it might value them more like a real estate company. So could be – I mean that leads merit or lends merit to him kind of cashing out now because of how the public market might react to the value. Yeah. Yeah, but it, and again, it goes back to the the thing that, okay, the CEO is cashing out. All the employees are still liquid. All the investors who've helped yeah. build this company are, are, are still liquid as well. But there's two scenarios. Maybe this you could, you could look at this negatively and say, oh, he's cashing out. He doesn't know what the public market is going to do, so he's getting his money now. Or another one, another scenario potentially could be that uh, you know, secondary investors really wanted shares of the yeah. company and pressured yeah. them to sell. So they could buy more shares. There's like definitely a positive way to look at it. There being is. that somebody clearly is, is willing to pay for whatever yeah. it is. So, I mean, there's, I can see that. I can see why it'd be viewed as bad from yeah. a founder perspective. Yeah. But it could definitely be a neutral or even positive, like, decision. like there's definitely more going on there that. Yeah. It's just more, generally people are more leaning on the negatives because of his history and doing some kind of shady things. Mm. It, like came out like six months ago. He was personally buying up properties under his name and, and then, then selling, selling them read that. so yeah so he's he would personally profit off uh real estate transactions to his own company that's losing billions a year yeah that's so 
because of that, people are, are just like, what the heck? So there, it looks like they're going to IPO. They're uh, kind of raising a lot of debt right now so that they don't have to raise as much mm-hmm. for the IPO. Uh, I mean, we'll I hope see. they do good. I definitely, I did a project on them in the like, whole presentation last semester. Um, and like, you want to see them succeed because they literally are real estate. Like whether you value them, however you value them, the amount of real estate they control, they're the biggest private uh, property owner in New York. Yeah. Private office owner, I'm pretty sure. Um, and like you, if they don't succeed, that's bad for everybody because they control so much of that market. So like that almost like I, oh, I hope they do succeed, even though I don't necessarily like them. Yeah. Well, I mean, their assets still hold value. It's just how but they're locked into like a 10 year lease or right with a lot of their properties. They don't buy out. Right. And then it's scary, but time will tell. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna let you take this one too. I don't know much about it, but fifth wall. Yeah. So I guess staying on the real estate path. So fifth wall, uh, is, is this firm out in LA that pretty much specifically does investments and startups that are working, like around property real estate tech. Okay. So property management, like investments, like any real estate tech, anything around real estate is what they do. And they've been wildly successful. They're one of the first firms that really honed in and did this. And their you know, advisory board and all their LPs are, are so aligned around that real estate focus. Like their advisory board, you know, is, is people, is, you know, CEO and board members of the largest real estate companies in the world. Like they do real estate and they kill it. Um, and, and so them raising their fifth fund, 500 million, it's, it's pretty impressive because it shows a really good example of a VC firm that specifies, hones in on one industry yeah. and just kills it. So I was going to say, it seems like a large fund for such a specific niche, yeah. but then you think about it, what they're doing is combining VC and startup and software and te- technology innovation, huge yeah. market with real estate, the oldest and biggest market. So like, I get it and it, it makes sense. And obviously if they're closing a fifth fund, they had four that went at least all right. Yeah, and it's cool. When I had a friend describe their process one time to me because they're so hyper-focused and so valuable to companies in the property tech uh, industry because their advisors, LPs, their connections, they can do whatever they want with any round like oh, they yeah. can wait if, if a round's too early they can wait till whatever like a, a company in this space will let them in at any yeah. time and because of their value awesome so that's why they flow. exactly because so that's why their returns can be insane because they can get into any round they want like that's people real will value make add, yeah. room for them because they're like they're the number one firm for this space that's a good place to be I mean, I would rather be the number one firm in a niche than like number five or 10 general VC, right? Just with the, the perks like that, you know, deals yeah. find you, you get complete flexibility there. Yeah, so they're killing it. So that, that's why uh, I think that's a big deal is, you know, you don't see a lot of firms that really dominate a niche industry mm-hmm. like, like Fifth Law does. Um, next topic. So this is the idea of seeding teams that are doing established business models. So like other replicating startups in the United States, for example, and bringing that to different countries. And I'll give the high level, but then Max will jump in the details. So we've talked about this a lot, like offline. Um, And the idea is that you, you know, Uber isn't in India. Uber is a owner of the part owner of the lead ride sharing company in India. I don't remember the name. And Southeast Asia, which is, which is Grab. Right. So like with those, what they're doing is taking an established model like Uber, well, however established you'll call it. Say hello. <laughs> Kaya. Um, and they're taking that established model and then using whatever cultural knowledge they have as an advantage and bringing it to their own market. Whereas Uber couldn't go there because they don't have that cultural awareness and that just actually living there and having experience and knowing how the market operates. And the idea here is that if you were a seed fund and you only focused on seeding companies using successful models with big examples in big markets like the United States or China, and then bringing it to still large but smaller outside markets around the world uh, and seeding teams in those new markets to replicate that for their home country. Right? Yeah, yeah. 
I, yeah, I think it's really fascinating. Um, the successes with ride sharing following Uber and, and Lyft, which all the international ones were founded after right. Uber and Lyft were founded, have been huge. Uh, I, I forget the name, but the, the ride sharing uh, equivalent in the Middle East just got bought by one point by one point two or one point five yeah. billion by Uber. Actually, uh, oh. Uber had to. Uh, seed market share in Southeast Asia to grab, mm -hmm. uh, but they they invested a ton of money and essentially became partners. But still, huge win for Grab. They just and that's huge on the Uber out of all of Southeast Asia. Yeah, if you're seeding these companies, <clears throat> that's wonderful. Especially if you have yeah. connections at the the home company, because yeah. if you know Uber and then you seed a company to go in and do it in a different country, then there's your acquirer. Uh, yeah, you build it to, for their needs. You know, exactly. So like, seeing all the Uber examples. You've seen all the scooter examples, yeah. like, you know, Bird and Lime and, and the other companies, Uber and Lyft, are battling out in the U.S. Uh, grow mobility in Mexico and Latin America has, in one year, they've they've hit pretty much the same, if not more, growth than Bird and, and Lime in the U.S. So now you're just looking at what other industries can this you know, apply to what what yeah. what other industries have an application in every market that might be slightly tailored to that market but can apply anywhere like yeah that ride sharing model works everywhere that where there's roads and cars maybe with some slight differences um it's also interesting wh who exactly you'd be seating you want you do want the expertise of the home company maybe somebody from there combined with a team of people uh in the in the new market or ideally somebody from the new market that's now working at the company, but I think those people are just as important to, um, like as as in terms of finding the companies, you want somebody with the expertise and like internal knowledge of the essentially the one you're copying, but then you also need them to have like a fundamental and intimate understanding of the market they're bringing it to. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think they should be native or at least very close to mm -hmm. whatever country or geography they're building that next company in. Uh, I think it's going to be hard to get from these super hot startups people to like fund a competitor because just the, the non competes are going to be insane. Yeah. Um, but definitely the native understand the culture and experience at a very high position somewhere. Like that's just that's just killer. And then you're looking at, uh, you know, what startups in the U.S. right now or in China right now can be seated somewhere else. Right. And it's probably companies that have been already active in the U.S. for two to four years. Or, you know, ones that have... It's or, be pretty easy to calculate market sizes, too. You literally say, all right, Uber in this size of a market in the United States, copy-paste with the population and statistics of a new market. Yeah. Ego can be... I mean, you won't beat Uber, but it is... There's definitely still room to create value there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, that's the epitome of globalization of the economy, is taking great innovation and copy and pasting it everywhere. Yeah. Maybe faster than Uber could expand to that market themselves. Yeah. Um, moving on for time's sake, India has not banned, 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 banned cryptocurrencies, but they, they formed a government panel that recommended a ban on private cryptocurrencies with jail of up to 10 years and a 250 million rupees fine, which is insane. 250, one, two, three, one, two, three rupees, USD, $3.5 million. Um, which is pretty serious, and it's interesting because you're seeing more governments pay attention to cryptocurrency. We saw the U.S. government with the Facebook Libra. Uh, they had that hearing just recently. Donald Trump recently tweeted about Bitcoin. Yeah. Like, there's more and more attention being paid to cryptocurrencies. And what you notice is that people, in government specifically, are afraid of it because of the dependency or their their need to control the fiat currency in their country. The problem here is you can't ban like you can't dissolve a cryptocurrency india couldn't shut down bitcoin for example um and there's there's no way like the way bitcoin works you have a public key and a private key if i have bitcoin in my wallet they can see there's a wallet there and there's bitcoin in it and they don't know i own it so in terms of enforceability granted there's way more than bitcoin so there are plenty of cryptocurrencies i imagine they could actually shut down and yeah. could enforce or at least you know force the the cryptocurrency company to show them the ownership but I, when I look at this, I look at it as a bullish indicator for Bitcoin specifically and crypto as a whole. Because if, if there's anything that's so disruptive that it's causing governments to, to be out. worried yeah. 
and talk about banning it, especially when it's something like Bitcoin that literally can't be banned. I view that as it's on the right track if it's making those types of waves. Yeah, it's, it's making people scared. And actually today, uh, I, I saw in the news, it was pretty funny. The U.S. Uh, treasurer, uh, Stephen Mnuchin, mm-hmm. would, I mean, he, he's worth like $40 million or something. He's a lot of money, but he uh, just quoted in a live interview, you know, in 10 years, I will not be holding a single cent of, of Bitcoin, really. <laughs> and, then, and, you know, people are scared of it. I mean, he's he's 56 years old. They're in the government. Uh, it, it's It's... I, I, you know, it's disrupting people. Yeah. people. It's getting on every single person's mind, even 56-year-olds in the government. And that's pretty impressive for something that was started, Oh yeah, you know, five years ago. Things you should, I mean, like, you know, my grandparents still write checks. Like, these things take time to adopt because this is society. This isn't yeah. just a product. Um, but pretty bullish indicator overall. And it just shows that people are caring. Whether it, they like it or they don't care, don't like it, they care. Definitely, yeah. Then lastly, we have DoorDash. And to explain the situation, I'm going to read a quote from the New York Times. For example, if DoorDash guaranteed a worker $7 for a delivery and a customer did not tip, DoorDash would directly pay the worker $7. If the customer tipped $3 via the app, DoorDash would directly pay the worker only $4, then then add on the $3 tip so the worker would still only get $7. Obviously, the issue here is that if you as a customer using DoorDash are tipping the driver and then it's just coming out of what DoorDash would already be paying the driver. You're not actually tipping the driver and they're essentially kind of scheming you into just subsidizing their compensation of their contractors. Not yeah. good. And, and the worst thing is the driver, uh, I mean, obviously this is going on for, been going on for a long time, but drivers don't notice this. It's, oh yeah. Don't, they see, they see the tip and think, Oh, that's cool. Uh, don't notice the fluctuation in wages or what that does. And technically, technically it's legal, I think. And I will it is, say it is that legal, DoorDash right? is the only one doing that guaranteed minimum. So like legality wise, with that guaranteed minimum, I think that's their, their catch all. Cause like all the other platforms do give the tip to the driver, but then their base rate varies. It does. Yeah. But DoorDash guarantees that seven. So there's still a way to look at it in that they're the only ones saying, you do this delivery, you'll get $7 no matter what. So there is an argument to be made that DoorDash um, is okay taking that variability of if the person's going to tip or not. In a way, you could view it, not necessarily that this is the way, you could view it that DoorDash is protecting their drivers against people that wouldn't tip because they're guaranteeing that $7 even if the driver doesn't tip. Whereas Uber Eats, they might get $3 and with a tip exceed 7 yeah. but with no tip, get under. So... But it, it's also a cultural thing. I mean, America right. is the biggest, really. Tipping is pretty ingrained in the culture. If you're tipping, the expectation usually is, you know, it's going to the person. DoorDash for deceiving people for, you know, the three, four years they've been in existence is it's pretty messed up. And, and funny, I saw uh, an email from Uber Eats. I actually don't really use DoorDash. I well, Maybe it, I it's either. dependent on the area we live in as well, but I, I only use Uber Eats and Postmates. Same. But, uh they he reads sent me an email yesterday. It's like, it's like just letting you know, your tips go directly to the drivers. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. That's like that. the OG Mac versus yeah. PC commercials. Yeah. So uh, interesting. I don't know. I, I I think it's people also are angry because they feel deceived just because oh, yeah. tipping is a big American thing. You expect it to go directly in the person's pocket. You're being nice. You're tipping based on service. Yeah. Well, we'll kick it to you. What do you think about DoorDash doing that? Guaranteeing $7 to the drivers, and if the user tips, then that just compensates DoorDash for that guarantee. Other than that, that's the end of this episode. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Fine afternoon. We'll see you in roughly a week. That's not a promise.